We are in uh, Paul at Athens in uh, Acts 17, uh, verse 16, which we saw last week the, the Thessalonians, uh, the beginning of the, the Thessalonian church, Paul at Thessalonica, and what was going on there, and some of the persecution that he underwent was pushed out of the city, and then he, he goes to uh, Athens, which is where we pick up here. And as Acts continues to, to develop and kind of selects things to, to present in, in Luke's narrative of, of what's going on here, of the er- birth and growth of the early church, uh, we've seen that the, the gospel comes first to Jerusalem, Jesus ascends, and the gospel, you have the, the Jewish church, but then the gospel expands, and that the gospel starts to go to the wider world and, and even to, to the Gentiles, which is good news for us as a Gentile church in the 21st century, that the gospel is for us as well. But as the gospel continues to spread, there's all kinds of things to account for in the birth and growth for the, of the church, of the place that, that suffering and, and persecution and tribulation has in the church. What, how are we to think of those things? And Paul writes uh, in other New Testament books and describes those things. But now in Acts 17, we really see how is, how is Christianity and the gospel supposed to interact with and engage with not just the, the general world that needs to have the gospel preached to it, but how is it supposed to interact with the, the world of, of ideas, the, the world of, of other religions, the world of, of other philosophies, other worldviews that, that don't agree with, with Christianity, that don't share the same presuppositions, that don't share the same values, that don't share the same commitments and methods and conclusions about the things that that we believe. Is Christianity supposed to just ignore it and to kind of just, okay, we just preach the gospel and move on? Um, Or are we supposed to find kind of points of commonality between us and and other worldviews of say, okay, well, uh, we kind of agree on this and we kind of agree on this and then try to get to the gospel from there? Or are we supposed to confront and engage uh, other worldviews? And Paul, I think, demonstrates that gives an example here of not just the the gospel message, but the the method of how the gospel is to be preached uh, apologetically. But the the question is, how will Christianity engage with the unbelieving world of ideas, which is, needless to say, still relevant for us today as we face all kinds of ideas all the time, other, other religions, other philosophies face the world of ideas and all the things that we see on, on social media, on things that we see on, on TV or movies or, or what we listen to. We're confronted with, with ideas uh, all the time. So in a sense, everyone, R.C. Sproul has said, everyone is a theologian. Everyone is a philosopher. They may not have a good philosophy or think very deeply about it or a good theology, but everybody has these these ideas. And whether or not ideas are true, sometimes is irrelevant because as we see it, sometimes it just really matters if an idea captures the imagination. But as Christians, we're committed to the truth. Jesus is the truth. God is the God of truth who cannot lie. The Holy Spirit's the spirit of truth. So we have an objective uh, ethical responsibility to, to truth. And so we have those, those commitments that we can't uh, just, just play around with ideas that we, uh, as it's been said, Christianity plays for keeps. We don't just uh, mess around with these ideas. So Acts 17 kind of pre- pre- uh, presents that, that what is the place of Christianity in the world of ideas? Is Christianity just another worldview among many? Is it just, even if we say it's the best, is it just one alternative among various alternatives? Uh, What is the place of of Christian intellectual engagement in the world? I think Acts 17 presents those things. So we'll look at three things today. A kind of major headings there. We'll look at Paul's context. We'll kind of look at the environment that Paul is in in Athens and see what's going on there. What is he? What is he facing as he's preaching the gospel? And we'll see Paul's sermon, the well-known sermon of, of Paul here uh, on Mars Hill. 
And then just briefly at the end, the, the results, what's the, the fruit, what, what happens uh, afterward. But first let's look at, uh, if you're taking notes, uh, this is the first point of Paul's context. What is Paul facing? What is, what's going on here? What's kind of the intellectual environment? Listen to Acts uh, 17 verse 16. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them, this is after the stuff with Thessalonica that we heard last week, that after Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Okay, so there's context point number one of that Paul is in the city of Athens, which is the, the center of Greek intellectual world. And they were, they were actually very open to the ideas of all kinds of other gods, all kinds of other uh, religions. They, they just didn't like when they didn't like when Judaism had come around, but Judaism had been around a long time. They didn't like when Judaism came around and said, okay, there's only one God and we reject all these other gods. But they thought, okay, that's just something that the Jewish uh, people do in their, their ethnic identity. What they really didn't, couldn't accept was when Christianity came around and said, no, we're calling everybody to turn from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what, where they started to have a problem. But they were very open and eclectic and could kind of, it's kind of like today, they had uh, so much openness that they could kind of mix and match all kinds of different worldviews and gods and different things. And the city here is full of idols. It used to be, the, there was a joke that was said at this time in Athens that it was easier to find in Athens a god than a man. Meaning you, there are so many idols everywhere and for everything that it was easier to find a god than a man. It's a little exaggeration, but that's, that's what it's talking about. And that Paul's observing this as he's waiting in Athens for kind of moving on his ministry forward. And he can't stand it. His spirit is being provoked within him. Uh, and this is the, the Greek word for provoked means he's being stimulated or stirred or aroused to, to even to anger or exasperated. This is the point where as he continues to observe this, knowing the truth of the gospel, knowing the dishonor that this brings on God, he, he has to speak. He can't keep his, his mouth shut any longer. And so when faced with this error, Paul is, is provoked to engage these false worldviews, preach the gospel to them, and call them to repentance and faith in Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that they're just going to, to accept his message, uh, even though it's true. It's, it's going to need the internal work of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's still going to get made fun of, that people are going to reject it, but he knows that the preaching of the gospel is the power of God. He goes on in Acts 17, continues to describe, so what does Paul do uh, in general? So he was reasoning with the, reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who were present. And this was kind of Paul's method as well, that he would, he would dialogue with them. He would reason with them. He would, he would not just preach the gospel and, and walk away, but he would provide uh, explanation and defense and, and walk through the, the implications of the gospel and the biblical worldview. Uh, that, that word for reasoning is, is dialoguing. It, it means to, to argue, to discuss, to, to even think thoughts uh, with and against each other. That's what the idea is, to ponder uh, those ideas. And so Paul is, is reasoning. He's calling them uh, to, to understand the truth. And so this is his pattern. He goes into the, the synagogues uh, with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and reasons with them. And then generally as they kicked him out, he would go to the Gentiles and was reasoning in the marketplace with those who happened to be present. And they kind of mis misunderstood what Paul was talking about because Paul's worldview and the gospel as it fits into that worldview from the, the biblical worldview, it just does not compute. 
Because it's not just the fact that Christianity and other worldviews, that they're on the same plane and we contribute these ideas and other people contribute these ideas. It's that they are two totally different categories of worldviews. They, they're not sharing uh, common authority. They're not sharing common ideas. They're not sharing common presuppositions. And so they misunderstand Paul. They think, Okay, he's proclaiming a bunch of strange gods. They listen to verse 18. He says, he says here, or Luke writes here, that, and also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what does this idle babbler wish to say? So they call him a, a seed picker, which is like a, a, an idle babbler that is a word for like a bird that's a seed picker who digs through the trash in order to get the little nuggets of garbage out of it. That's what he's saying. Paul, you're just a secondhand trader in, in weird ideas. And then others say uh, in verse 18, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So the word Jesus, the noun Jesus is, is masculine. The uh, word resurrection is in the feminine form. So they, they are thinking, wait a second, so he's saying Jesus is a god and there's this goddess resurrection? Is that what's going on? And so they're misunderstanding Paul because he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection from the dead, you know, the centerpieces of the gospel, and it cannot compute for them because it's not just about proving the resurrection. They wouldn't understand the resurrection even if Paul did prove the fact of it because they have a totally different worldview. They have a totally different understanding of, of everything. Let me talk just briefly about uh, Paul's kind of intellectual environment that he's facing and some of the kind of common ideas that were there in that time. And, and those, those were ideas in history. They ideas tend to have this thing where they cycle through and we see them at different points of history and even today. So I don't think any of this stuff will sound unfamiliar. It, they may be points of them, but the overall things that they believe um, are very similar to what, what we experience today. They're not, not that uh, far removed. Their, their ideas get recycled through time and then they reappear. Uh, and then people realize, well, wait a second, this didn't work. And they realized that hundreds of years ago, let's move to the next one. And it continues to go through that process. But we've already seen, it's, it's a world of, of religious superstition and idolatry. There's all kinds of different religions. People loved sharing their gods, and it was, you were, it was okay to add on other gods, worship all kinds of uh, multiple gods and idols, and they had idols for everything. Uh, and so it's a world of religious superstition. It's also a world that's been influenced in, in Greek culture and thinking by the uh, philosopher and, of Plato. And he, you know, he invented the kind of clay stuff he played with. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not that type of Plato. Uh, he, he is the kind of the, the major Western thinker who develops this kind of idea of rationalism. Plato's idea is if we could just use reason autonomously, we mean on our own, and really think carefully about the nature of the world, the nature of reality, the nature of ethics, and use our reason, we should be able to get to conclusions about truth, conclusions about knowledge, conclusions about reality, conclusions about right and wrong. And it kind of seems to make some sense, uh, but Plato develops this idea, and he says, so his big thing is go and think about it, reason about it. Uh, Plato eventually, though, the problem with this, uh, this worldview is when you just use reason, it has to depend on itself, and it runs into these problems that even with Plato, he just started making a bunch of stuff up. He had to say, okay, there's this, there's this unchanging eternal principles of reason, but how does that apply to a changing world? There is, so he made up this world of forms, which was like the ideal perfect world, and so he said, okay, the physical world must be bad, and the spiritual world must be good. And so this also started to develop a very strong uh, idea during this time, during the time of Jesus, during the time of gospel, of what's called Greek dualism, that the spirit is good and the body is bad. And, and therefore, and that was, most of these philosophies will share that assumption. And so if you talk about God, who was supposedly not knowable, 
coming into the world as a man and dying, not only dying, but being resurrected from the dead in his body, that would not compute. And that's why they're mocking Paul and scoffing at Paul for talking about Jesus and the resurrection. It's not because it's not true. It's because it doesn't make sense in their worldview. So it's a worldview of, of Greek rationalism, dualism. Uh, Plato's student, hundreds of years before Jesus, Aristotle, said, okay, rationalism eventually becomes irrational. Instead of just think about things, Aristotle takes a different direction. He says, let's go out into the world and observe. Truth comes through observation. Truth comes through our senses, that we observe the world around us, that we make sense of those things, and then that we categorize it. And that makes some sense, too. All these things can make sense within the biblical worldview, but what Paul's going to show is that they don't make sense outside of the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview can make sense of reason using data from your senses, because God's created those things, and that's how God's world works. But if you just assume those things as authorities, they self-defeat and it falls apart. And that's what all these philosophers started to realize is they got to dead ends in their philosophies. So Aristotle rejects his teacher Plato and says, no, let's go out into the world and observe truth comes through observation and that truth can only, and knowledge can only be known through observation. And so can ethics. Ethics can only be known through observation. Uh, it, because of the failures of these uh, philosophies and the dead ends that they reached, it was also common during this time and, and through and past the time of Jesus and Paul to get to a, an idea of skepticism. If reason fails us, if observation fails us, then can you really know anything? And so you had these worldviews, sometimes called in that time Puranism or skepticism, which is that you can't know anything. We can't trust reason. We can't trust our minds to tell us anything about the nature of reality, knowledge, truth, right and wrong, anything whatsoever. Now that runs into problems too because it's a claim that, to, to knowledge that you can't know anything. So even the people who say you can't know anything are still showing that they have knowledge. Okay, so it, all these philosophies run into to serious problems. So some people got into the, the who cares philosophy. These were the sophists. These were the relativists. They were the, the people who said, there's no truth. There's no right and wrong. There's power. There's political power. And man is the measure of all things. And so what we should do is try to use language most effectively to gain power and influence. And, the, and it doesn't really matter because there's no standard of truth and lies of right and wrong. These are the sophists. And if you probably recognize that today, there, we have people saying, just use your reason. You have people saying, use your observations, follow the science, etc. You have people saying you can't know anything to be true. And you have people saying it doesn't matter. No one knows. There is no right and wrong. There is no true or false relativism. And then uh, within all that, once those all fail, you have mysticism. People that, okay, I just want to kind of feel some sense of spirituality. You see that in Acts 17. They have gods for everything. They, want, they even have gods to whom it may concern, the unknown god. They have gods for, for all types of things. They just, they just have one, this mystical feeling. That's around today as well. You'll have people, it, here's the interesting thing about today, is you'll have what I call buffet style or Frankenstein worldviews. Buffet style, I mean that people can go, it, we're in a free intellectual environment, which is good, it's, it, nobody should be forced, but we're in a free intellectual environment, so what that allows people to do is select and leave behind what they like and don't like, like at a buffet, even if they contradict each other. Uh, or what I call Frankenstein worldviews, which means that you take a bunch of uh, pieces and sew together something, uh, but really it's, it's dead. And that's, the, that's kind of what's going on today. So that's why you'll have today people saying, use your reason, but they'll also be mystics. They'll say, this is wrong, but they'll also be relativists and say, you can't really know right and wrong. That's, that's a socially constructed idea based on your culture. 
They'll say, follow the science, but they'll also talk about that the stars influence your life. Right? So you have a grab bag of these. You guys have seen this. It's not, you know, and we have to be careful of this too. Because for us, truth is not just a matter of whether we get the facts correct. It's a matter, matter for us of, of obedience and faithfulness. Right? So we can be uh, led away by, by ideas as well. That's what Paul warns about in Colossians 2, being led astray by philosophies rather than according to Christ. Uh, and then the, what, the two that are mentioned here specifically are the Epicureans and the Stoics. And let me tell you a little bit more about the Epicureans and the Stoics who are arguing with Paul. Uh, the Epicureans are, are naturalist materialists. So this is... Not totally correct, but I'll use it for the uh, sake of the example. They're the evolutionists. They're the ones who say there's no supernatural explanation for the world. It is, there is matter made up of atoms. It's in motion. There's, the, there's physics, biology, and chemistry. And the product of those working according to natural forces is what brings about everything including humans, including human thoughts, including human ideas. Materialism. So this is, this is a, an idea that's not new either, that everything is based on materialism, natural processes. Okay? No God, nothing supernatural. The gods don't even, they even believe that if there were gods, they were, they were physical matter as well. And so the Epicureans said, okay, how do we account for reality? They say, well, it's all material. And they said, what, you know, the original reality was this. It was atoms falling through space. So there's atoms falling through space. And that, that is what accounts for, and somehow they kind of eventually bumped into each other. And that that is, really, this is what they said. And that this is, that is what accounts for, according to chance chaos, everything in the world around us today. But then they realize there are a couple problems. Number one, you, in that worldview, you cannot say anything is true or false because it's just matter. It's just stuff. Stuff is not right or wrong, true or false. Uh, number two, they realized that they destroyed any idea of human choice because stuff, material, does not make meaningful human choices. So they said, okay, we've got to avoid that. So they started making up. They said, okay, we had the atoms falling through space. They made up this idea called the swerve. They said, okay, at some point, the atoms falling through space swerved, bumped into each other, and that's what created human free will and meaningful choice. See, so when your philosophy doesn't work and leads you to absurdity, just make something up in order to avoid that. That's what they did. And then they were calling Paul, you know, scoffing at Paul for proclaiming the resurrection, right? But their worldview would destroy knowledge, truth, ethics, everything human responsibility, choice, uh, everything that they wanted to account for. But they really hated uh, the idea of resurrection. And so, in short, in uh, Epicureanism, it followed a, a cosmology, meaning where the world come from, and a worldview that says everything's material. Materialism, naturalism, and all this is development by chance. Okay, that, that philosophy is not new. Um, let me read you a quote from one of the Epicurean philosophers. And you have this there in your notes. That's why I wanted the notes, so you could see these. Now, you can see why they're going to hate resurrection. Listen to this quote uh, from Philodemus, the Epicurean philosopher. They believe that dying, by the way, that your soul was material as well, and that when you died, your soul just was material that just spilled out and was just matter in another form. So no big deal. So this is their quote. There is nothing to fear in God, because if there's a God or the divine, they're basically just physical matter as well, or, or don't have anything to do with the world. There is nothing to be alarmed in at death. Good is easy, easily obtained. Evil is easily endured. So basically the Epicureans say, hey, look, in a world where we're all just matter in motion, physics, biology, chemistry, operating according to chance chaos. You don't need to fear death. You don't need to fear God or the gods. They're not involved with this world. They're just a bunch of matter as well. And when you die, it's all over, right? And so the uh, Epicureans uh, could not, according to their worldview, accept the gospel, accept resurrection. 
Listen to another uh, Epicurean philosopher, Lucretius. He says, we will begin our task with an explication of nature's first principle. Nothing is ever created by divine power out of nothing. So they would reject the idea that God created the world. For fear paralyzes all mortals when they cannot find a rational explanation for the causes of many things happening in heaven and on earth. And so they think these things happen through some divine agency. But when we have seen that nothing can be created out of nothing, we will then perceive more accurately the answers we are pursuing, and we will learn how things are created and how the universe came to be without the agency of the gods. So he says, look, the world's not created by the gods. It's the product of chance chaos. And once we look for natural explanations, we'll, we'll find better answers to those things. Uh, and he says, basically, fear is what, what causes people to look for that God created the world. Stoicism is the other uh, philosophy mentioned here that the Stoic philosophers are debating with Paul. And they're materialists as well. They think everything comes down to physical matter. But they're more pantheists. They believe in the idea of God or a God, uh, or, or a God, but that he is also physical matter and that he's kind of like, as the soul is to the body, so God is to the universe. And so what you call God is kind of the sum total of all reality. That God's kind of part of his, uh, of his creation. He's not really distinct from his creation and he's not personally involved in his creation. So the Stoics believed in, in fate, they believed in, in reason, they believed in logic, or they called all these things God, that was kind of just the, these historical forces that would kind of work within the material world to bring things about. Listen to a quote uh, from Seneca, who's one of the Stoic philosophers who is a contemporary of Paul. His, here's his presupposition. All things are made up of matter and God. Those are the two realities. So they're kind of a pantheism. Everything together all that reality is what you call God in their worldview. And so the Stoics, they believed that, uh, that the world uh, was physical matter and that God kind of was poured into it like honey into a honeycomb is how it's been described. Uh, let me read another quote from Seneca. Of, of, so when they believed this, they thought, okay, there's no reason to think that God's involved in the world. There's no reason to think that our bodies are meaningful. And there's no reason to believe in resurrection. Listen uh, to Seneca as he goes on further. He says, whenever it seems the right time, I will end my partnership with my body. There's a disdain for the body here. Even now, while we are associated, we will not be partners on equal terms because the soul will assume all authority. Contempt for one's body is absolute freedom. So for the Stoics, death is the release from the chains of the body. So the idea of resurrection is, is crazy to the Stoic philosophers. It goes on, it says, and what is death? They don't fear death. And what is death? It is either the end or a process of change. I have no fear of ceasing to exist. It will be the same as not having to be begun. Nor do I shrink from changing into another state because under no conditions will be as cramped as I am now. So basically, my body's chaining me to this existence. I'm, I'm looking forward to death because when I die, I'm either just done or it, it'll just be matter in another state. And so Paul, this is the, the philosophical environment of, of Paul's time, but I think we can see some connection points to these are pretty similar ideas to the world of ideas that we live in and interact with all the time in our day today. It's, it's nothing new. And so Paul is, uh, what you're seeing here is Paul is preaching the gospel and, these, and he's preaching it from the biblical worldview and the, according to the scriptures. And all these worldviews share in common a few common commitments. They reject the ability to know God. They say it's not possible to know God, even if he did exist. There's no way you can know him. He wouldn't be personally involved in the world. Rejection of, of God's involvement in history and especially rejection of the idea of resurrection of the body from the dead. And so that's exact, and those are, are key things of the gospel. God created the world, governs and rules the world, sent his son into the world, incarnated into the flesh, died for our sins, and was raised from the dead. So you see why the gospel does not fit in with these other worldviews. Um, and by the way, it doesn't fit in 
today either, uh, and it's not supposed to. It, it shows that these other worldviews are, are bankrupt, um, and that's why the other worldviews don't like it. And so, anyway, it, it, the, Paul is being mocked here, and then Paul is kind of arrested. Now, he's not literally arrested, like he doesn't, he doesn't get put in chains, but he does get called to account. Listen to Acts 17, 19 through 21. It says, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, Wait, may we know this new teaching that you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Okay. So Luke gives this kind of an editorial. He, he describes what he's seeing and he gives some analysis here. And he says, look, the Athenians love giving and hearing something new. And the visitors, and they love incorporating all kinds of new ideas. But Paul gets uh, here, the word is seized. And the word seized in other places in Acts usually means arrested. Now, Paul's not put in chains, but we do see a pattern in Acts, preaching the gospel, and then he appears before the authorities. Preaching the gospel appears before the authorities, and we're going to see the same thing here. So they take Paul, basically, for an exploratory hearing, that basically, we need you to present, what is Christianity about? How does it fit? Is it a threat to the world of ideas that we have, or is it going to somehow assimilate to the world of ideas that we have? Um, and what this wording here is actually similar. When they're talking about, hey, Paul, you're bringing a, a new teaching. These are strange things. It's actually very similar wording uh, to a text called The Trial and Death of Socrates, where uh, a couple hundred years before, Socrates, the philosopher, had gotten in big trouble in Athens for bringing in his philosophy and questioning things that they didn't feel like he should question. And they, they accused Socrates of the same thing, bringing in some new teaching. And eventually, they, uh, after that trial, they put Socrates to death. So to kind of give you the idea of what Paul is, uh, is facing here is he's being called to account. Does Christianity fit within the world of ideas? Does it, is, is, is it ignore the world of ideas, or is it something that's going to disturb the world of ideas and, and upend everything? And so that's what uh, is going on here as Paul is brought into uh, the Areopagus. Here, look at Acts uh, 17, verse 18. Where it talks about Paul being at, at the uh, Areopagus or in... Oh, actually, let's look at verse 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and then he begins his sermon. Let me just tell you one thing before we get into our next point of Paul's sermon here. The Areopagus uh, was built and had this kind of historical myth around it. The Areopagus was supposedly uh, founded after this battle that took place from this god Apollo. Okay, you've heard of the Greek god Apollo. Okay, Apollo comes in and fights these monsters and fights this battle and kills a bunch of people and is successful in this battle. And so the battle is, it, the field is, is laid with a bunch of dead bodies. And they, they had a song that took place uh, about Apollo after doing this. And then they built the Areopagus. Okay, now Apollo wasn't real, but this is kind of the myth of how the Areopagus was, was founded. And basically, the, the story was this. After Apollo killed all his enemies, here's how the little, like the, the poem went uh, to Apollo. It says, but when the dust has drawn up the blood of a man, once he is dead, there is no return to life. In other words, the Areopagus was built by the god of Apollo and in his honor and his poem, that the big statement from that poem is, there is no resurrection. As soon as man has died and the ground draws up his blood, there is no resurrection. There is no return to life. And so Paul is about to get into the Areopagus, whose founding principle is there is no resurrection, with people who reject every aspect of his 
worldview. And he's about to preach the gospel centering on the resurrection of the dead, of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is not in a friendly intellectual environment. It doesn't mean he's in trouble necessarily. It just means that this is not a welcome environment for Paul unless he's going to give them something like, okay, well, you know, our worldviews can can kind of mesh and work work together, and I'm just presenting another alternative. Um, But that's not what Christianity does. Listen to uh, F.F. Bruce here on the book of Acts. He talks about this uh, this idea of there being no resurrection, the idea of uh, Apollo here. He says, the god Apollo on the occasion... uh, When that very court of the Areopagus was founded by the city's patron goddess uh, Athene, once a man dies and the earth drinks up his blood, there is no resurrection. Some of them therefore ridiculed a statement which seems so absurd. Which means Paul's gospel is not in a place where it will be accepted, except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the centerpiece of the biblical message is antithetical to the, biblical, to the unbiblical world of ideas. But let's look at Paul's sermon. Let's look at Paul's sermon here that he, he preaches. Now, so Paul now, in this environment, just to kind of see that the, the pressure is on now for Christianity and the presentation of the gospel. And, and a, a significant choice has to be made here. And Paul has to kind of set a precedent and set an example uh, for, for how Christianity is going to stand going forward. And so this is a significant uh, choice that he makes. He can ignore the world of ideas and say, okay, I'm not going to deal with this. I just walk away, just have my kind of side gospel for people who want to hear it, but not, not proclaim it to the world. Or he could try to assimilate hey, you know what, we all have ideas, my idea is like your idea, and they all kind of, we can find points of commonality um, and and try to connect them together and say, okay, well, I think mine's a little bit better at this, but maybe yours contributes that, and we all have some piece of the truth. Or he has to confront and engage uh, the intellectual world of ideas, which is what, uh, what he decides to do. But Paul shows that these worldviews that he's approaching it, that really any worldview outside of biblical, the biblical worldview and Christianity, that they are self-defeating. It's not just that they, uh, it's not just that Christianity is incrementally a little bit better. Paul is going to present, I think this is the thrust of the, of the scriptures, that without assuming the presuppositions of the biblical worldview, except with starting with God as the authority as your starting point, any of these worldviews becomes self-destructive, meaning they, they internally collapse in on themselves. Now, why they don't do that, Paul talks about in Romans 1, is because they borrow from God's truth and God's world in order to use that knowledge disobediently in order to reject God. So it's not that man does not know God. It's that man sinfully wants to use the knowledge that God has given him to create a vast array of philosophical systems and ideas that may sound very valid and, and all of this stuff and complicated, but Paul says, really, it's, it's all this is a front for ideas that are bankrupt and show that they are just attempts at avoiding the knowledge of the God who is the creator to whom everybody is accountable. And so that's what Paul is going to present. He's going to do uh, an internal critique of their worldview. He's going to show that that their worldviews are wrong in their presuppositions, they're wrong in their methods, they're wrong in their conclusions. In other words, they're wrong in the things that they start out assuming, how they get to their ideas in in putting their ideas together, and they're wrong in their conclusions of what they decide to be true and right at the end. And so Paul engages in what's called an internal critique by presenting the gospel in this way. for time's sake, I'm going to move forward here, but let me read Proverbs uh, 26, 4, and 5 that presents this, this concept. Now, it almost seems like a contradiction, but Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5 are right next to each other. It says, 
The writer says, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you will be like him. Answer a fool as his folly deserves that he may not be wise in his own eyes. Okay, so are we supposed to answer the fool or not? Well, the answer is yes and no. We're not supposed to answer a fool according to his folly, meaning we're not supposed to join a fool, which in biblical terminology is someone who rejects, ethically rejects the truth of God and rebels against it. We're not supposed to join with them in their foolishness, starting with them pretending to be neutral, like, okay, well, I'll pretend that the word of God is not true in order to join you to try to reason you to accept the authority of the word of God and Jesus Christ. Uh, we're not supposed to join the, the unbeliever in their worldview. But uh, otherwise, we're going to become a fool just like them. We'll be reasoning according to foolish ideas, foolish presuppositions. But we are supposed to answer the fool, answer the fool according as his folly deserves, so that he will not be wise in his own eyes. Meaning we are supposed to demonstrate and show up a mirror of if your worldview were true, here would be the consequences. And therefore, your worldview cannot be true. And because of that, that you're showing that your, your worldview is not only self-defeating, but you need to repent, change your mind, and believe in Christ, who <laughs> is the representation of God, who is the unlying, unlying God, who's the creator, who makes possible reason, knowledge, science, ethics, rationality, all of these things, and make sense of those things. Because if you reject those, you end up in foolishness. And so Paul, let's get into the, the sermon here. Paul says, uh, let's look at his observation in verse 22. He says, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining your objects of worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you proclaim in ignorance, this, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. And so Paul says, makes this observation. He goes in, look, I see that you're religious. You have some desire of connection with the divine, okay? Or you're kind of superstitious. You have gods for everything. But Paul points out a very perceptive thing about them. He goes, look, for all your ideas that you bring in, for all of your ideas that you collect and trade in and like to talk about and hear new things, and for all the gods that you worship, you really, amidst all this so-called knowledge, you really admit your own ignorance. And he says, yeah, I've observed your superstitiousness. And he says, but you yourselves admit you still have this altar to the unknown God. You still admit that even in all your claims to knowledge, you don't really know anything. And so, and, and that's very common in, in all worldviews as well, because who would say they know everything? Nobody does. That's, that's true. But... People love to claim knowledge, and then when it comes to authority, they say, well, I don't know anything. But they'll tell you, oh, you need to believe this or don't believe that. But then when it comes down to authoritative worldviews, I don't know. I don't know anything. And so Paul says, what you worship in ignorance, you're admitting your ignorance, but you're also showing that it's culpable ignorance. Your ignorance is that of unbelief. It's that you know God, but you're denying him. And that you may create all kinds of elaborate systems and ideas, but really it's based on ignorance. You're trying to avoid the God who you know to be your creator, to whom you're accountable. And that's why Paul calls them to repentance. And so he says, you know, it's kind of like the guy who had the, the uh, bumper sticker, the don't follow me, I'm lost. That's what, the, that's what these other worldviews are. I don't know, but here's my ideas. You know, I'm, I'm lost, but here's what I think about this. How would you ever know that to be true or authoritative or right? Uh, Plato, in one of his writings, was talking about how the world got created. So he, he said, it's probably not like this, but this is how we'll imagine it. 
and he really said this, and he said, okay, the, the, it was created by some demiurge who was a kind of a bad god who created the physical world, because Plato had to explain, how do you get the perfect world that is not matter and reason and all this stuff, and, and connect it with the changing world that we live in? He said, well, it must have been some unknown unknown god, some demiurge or something. And so Plato said, but you could never really know the true god. You could never really know the father and maker of the universe. And even if you did know him, you couldn't talk about him. But that's the, those are two key things of the, the biblical message. God is known. God has made himself known and he speaks and he's known through his word. And so it's kind of this don't follow me, I'm lost thing that Paul points out to him, that they, they are claiming both knowledge and ignorance. And Paul says, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So I'll move on a little quicker through this, but let's look at Paul's sermon. He talks first about the transcendent creator. He says, the God who made the world and all things in it. Okay, so he immediately starts off. All their worldviews are not going to allow them to accept this God, who's the creator, they, they will not compute with this. They, they, they cannot accept it. But Paul demonstrates, he says, the, the world is created by God. It's not, God's not part of the world. He's, it's not just natural chance chaos. It's not the world of ideas. It's not the unknown God. It's that it's cre- God has created the world. He's the transcendent maker and governor of the world. And that in his creation, everything depends on him, including knowledge, reason, observation. All these things depend on God. And in doing that, if you think about some of the uh, philosophical alternatives, you have rationalism, which is using reason in order to prove reason. Reason is good, but in in the biblical worldview can account for it. God's the God of truth. We have an ethical obligation to the truth. God says, come, let us reason together. Paul reasons. But if you just make reason an authority, you have to use it in order to prove it. That's, That's a logical fallacy. That's question begging. That's circular reasoning. And it's arbitrary. It's, 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 has no authority. Same thing with observation. You just observe, you know, the, the, all, all truth comes through observation and the experience of our, of our senses. You can't observe logic. You can't observe knowledge. You can't you go, go get a scoop of knowledge and look at it under a microscope. You can't observe ethics. And so the, even the claim of empiricism, that all truth comes through observation, cannot be subject to what it claims, meaning you can't even observe that truth. And so it's, it's false. Materialism, Epicureanism, everything's guided by chance. Random chance chaos. Well, then how do you have... Then why call anybody to reason? If, if, if the person who's talking about materialism and naturalism and chance chaos and that everything developed by, uh, by evolutionary processes, then there is no right or wrong, correct or incorrect. It's just stuff. There's, uh, there's no difference between correct thoughts and incorrect thoughts. Thoughts are just chemical processes. There's no right or there's no wrong. And you can't say, hey, you should be reasonable. Should doesn't exist in a materialistic worldview. And so it destroys knowledge. Here's, here's a quick uh, apologetic uh, hint. If somebody's talking about you know, evolution and stuff, and we're talking about the macro evolution and chance chaos and that type of thing, that that's what created the world. And they're saying you shouldn't believe in Christianity Say, well, according to your worldview, my mind, my brain evolved to think this way. My brain evolved to think this way. It's, I'm a product of chemicals and physics and biology. So I'm not right and I'm not wrong and you're not right and you're not wrong if your worldview is true. You can't tell me that I should or shouldn't think. And by the way, I wouldn't have a choice to make. I'm just stuff. So my brain evolved to make me a Christian. Your brain evolved to make you an atheist, according to your worldview. So why, why are you bothering me? Why, you know, why try to debate? 
so that it, it destroys knowledge, it destroys ethics, it dis these other worldviews destroy themselves. Same thing with Stoicism. It's the, that the idea of everything's guided by this kind of material reason or fate, but that's impersonal. And so Paul goes on, he says, the God who created the world, he says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life and breath and all things. So we see here that God is not only the creator, he's the sovereign, sovereign Lord and the governor of everything, of the world. And that he's also personal. Look, listen to Acts 17, 26 and 27. This is against the Stoics in particular. They say, well, okay, even if there are gods or even a god, he's not personal. He doesn't care about us. It says in verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined and appointed their times and boundaries of their habitation, and that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. And so in saying that, Paul has just claimed that the personal God is in charge of the world and in charge of history and personally involved in those things. And during this time, a cyclical view of history was very common where they thought everything just kind of wrapped around and came back again and just kept going like this. And Paul's saying, no, 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 you misunderstand. God's moving history forward to a certain point in time. And so God is not the sum total of his creation, but he's the creator and Lord who upholds his creation and is seen in the history of the world. He's also not the product of man's thoughts. Listen in Acts 17, uh, 28 through 29. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your poets have said, for we are also his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image, now this is really key here, an image formed by the art or thought of man. Then in other words, why would we assume that God, working bottom up from our thoughts and our ideas and stuff in the created world, what we can form together with our hands or what we can think of with our minds, that that must be what God is like. And so what Paul is getting at here is he says, and he's not agreeing with the, the poets, and he's saying, look, even some of your poets get, get a few things kind of right. He says even when they're wrong, they still show their knowledge of God by saying we're also his children. So even in, in layers of suppression of the truth, they still even show that they have the knowledge of God. And so, what makes us think that, any, that God is like things formed by the art and thought of man? That this is a, a failure of, of natural theology that we can think of our own thoughts and build our way up to what God is like. The biblical worldview is that we know what God is like because, number one, he's created the world and maintains it, and we have our, that revelation of God in our hearts as his image in our conscience. But we also know we, what God is like because he tells us in his word. And so that's, that's how we know. We don't guess. We don't speculate. And so Paul demonstrates by saying these things, very simple but profound, he demonstrates that truth does not come from chance chaos. It does not come from human thoughts and speculation. And the only alternative is it comes from God's revelation. That's it. Those are, those are the options as far as human thought. Human thought, truth, knowledge, ethics come from one of three sources. They are either the product of impersonal chance chaos. It just is what it is. The world has formed this way. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's not correct. It's not incorrect. It just is. Or it comes from human minds, which means it's just opinion. We just talk it out. We fight it out. We vote it out, whatever the case it is. But it's just, it's not true. It's just human opinion. Or it comes from God's revelation. And that's the only, only God's revelation saves human thought, meaningful human thought, reason, science, ethics, knowledge, anything else. So when people reject the biblical worldview, 
they say, well, you know, they call us to use reason, science, all these things, and which the Christian worldview can account for without any problems. But it's not just, oh, the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview is, is a little more true. It's that when they release the biblical worldview, if God would allow man to be consistent in his rebellion, they would destroy knowledge. They would destroy truth. They would destroy right and wrong. They would destroy ethics because that's what those worldviews do. It's not just that they're unbiblical, it's that they're self-defeating. Other worldviews are, are intellectually suicidal. I was working on a project with Jamie. We're working on something with the book of Job. We're talking about how the book of Job shows that the, the biblical worldview and the word of God is the foundation for, uh, for knowledge, a bunch of things, and we're working through some of that stuff. And I was writing about a little section on postmodernism, and I, which is kind of like relativism, but it just says that nothing's true, everything's interpretation. And I, at the end, I basically wrote this sentence that said, you know, after postmodernism has allegedly deconstructed and destroyed every other worldview, it then commits suicide and kills itself because it shows that, it says that no worldview can be true, there's no truth, and so what the postmodernist is asking you to do is saying, don't listen to me, so don't. You know, and that's what every worldview ultimately amounts to. Don't listen to us because we're, don't follow me, I'm lost. It, does ha it has no authority. So Paul, in this simple sermon, this is why I provided those notes. Hope maybe it'll be good to go back over to kind of review some of this stuff to see kind of the details here. But Paul's simple sermon has shown Christianity is engaging with the other worldviews, the intellectual world of ideas, in such a way to show that they have nothing and that the only alternative is to turn to Christ, is God's revelation. But they have one way out. Even if everything Paul is saying is true, we can still escape it in death. Death, there's no resurrection. We can still avoid the consequences of, of being wrong. But Paul doesn't allow them that way out. Listen to the last few verses of his sermon. He says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring that all men everywhere should repent. Why? I mean, what, how is God, why, what makes that uh, statement true? Listen to verse 31. Because he is fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof by raising him from the dead. And so why is repentance connected with Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Because the whole pattern of, of life is man dies, doesn't come back from the dead, and they've uh, built a philosophical system around the idea of there is no resurrection, my, body just, my soul just pours out, I just change, I just die and I'm done. But now resurrection means accountability. God has now reversed the course of history in Jesus by showing, no, Jesus died and rose from the dead. And now that demonstrates that everyone is ultimately accountable because God will, it, this shows that God will judge the world. So in Christian apologetics, it's not just enough to show that uh, it, you don't just go to the unbeliever and say, okay, let me prove to you that, uh, that Jesus rose from the dead. Even if you're successful in proving the factual accuracy of Jesus being raised from the dead, which is true, the unbeliever will not necessarily accept it. They'll just think that that's some weird freak occurrence. They won't say, okay, well, even if Jesus rose from the dead, that, what does that mean to me? But that's not the way Paul sees it. Paul sees it in the total biblical framework. He challenges the whole system of ideas. It's not that they just need a little more information. It's that they need to repent and totally change their mind to adopt a different worldview uh, that accounts for the truth and that is centered around the resurrection. Um, 
read a quote here from a great philosopher, a great uh, apologist, Cornelius Van Til. He says, it takes the fact of the resurrection to see its proper framework, and it, sees the, it takes the framework to see the fact of the resurrection. Meaning you need both. We have the historical fact and the explanation of the fact of Jesus' resurrection in the scriptures. So it's not just proving to the unbeliever, hey, if I can prove to you that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, will they repent and believe? Maybe, but probably not. So what we're calling the unbeliever to, like Paul, is, is we're calling them to a total change of worldview to acknowledge that no, your worldview can't be true because it either depends on chance, chaos, or human speculation. The alternative is God's revealed truth, especially in the person of Christ. And that brings ultimate accountability. And so Paul finishes his sermon with this call to repentance. And he's shown that Christianity doesn't assimilate with the world of ideas. It doesn't ignore the world of ideas, but it actually engages uh, and overcomes the world of ideas. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be welcome in the world of ideas. It's kind, it, it does not play nice in this, this world of ideas. Uh, and so this is why Paul says uh, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, he says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience to Christ. In other words, Christianity uh, is playing to win, and it takes captive and destroys thoughts, ideas, speculations, and wants to bring every area of thought and life under the lordship of Jesus. And so it, it is not just like uh, the movie, The Book of Eli, you know, where the guy, uh, you may or not have seen it, but this guy uh, is, is trying to bring the last Bible to be saved, you know, and, and, and it's this kind of action movie. And then um, when he finally gets it to this place where it's going to be preserved, they just take the Bible and set it on the shelf with a bunch of other books. And it's kind of the message at the end is, oh, it didn't really matter. Um, but it's not like that. It's that, no, there's, there's the biblical worldview in general and Christianity in particular and the gospel. And that that is the, the worldview that accounts for everything and that every worldview is either going to be destroyed or brought into obedience to Christ. And so what are the results? Finish here. This just briefly, it says, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back, it says, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So there's kind of this dual reaction. Some are, all right, we'll, we'll listen again. And some can't take it when Paul talks about the resurrection. So Paul went out of their midst, but some of them joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So even this guy named Dionysius, named after a Greek god and called the Areopagite, meaning he probably worked there, who's named after this place that says there is no resurrection, he believed. The, the gospel was preached to him, he, he repented. So there is some fruit, but there's also mocking, and that's to be expected. But the call uh, that Paul gives here in the sermon is the same one to us today, that, that, Christ has, that God has fixed a day in Christ of, of judgment, that we are, we are accountable before God, that we, we know God. And I don't think that's a surprising statement to people sitting in a church on a Sunday morning, but uh, knowing about God is not the same thing as knowing God. God has made himself known to every person in the general revelation of, of how he's created his world and our minds and how this world is upheld by him. Every person knows God but is in, a, uh, is in rebellion against God unless God changes their hearts. His saving revelation is in Christ and in the scriptures where God has sent Christ into the world to save sinners and the centerpiece of that, showing that that was for our justification, is Christ's resurrection from the dead. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the proof that those who trust in Christ are righteous before God is Jesus' resurrection. And so Christianity 
brings ultimate accountability to the world of ideas. So there may be people here who have never submitted to Christ in, in your thoughts, in your life, in turning to Christ and saving faith. Um, you need to do that today. The, the warning is still the same, that Christ, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world through a man whom he has appointed, having given proof by raising him from the dead. Resurrection from the dead changes everything. And so we are all accountable to God. And as believers, we are all accountable to God in every single area of our, of our thoughts and our lives, trying to come into conformity to Christ. And so we all fall short of that perfect standard, but that's what we are to be striving for. So let's close in a word of prayer and go to worship. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your, your word. Thank you for the, the truth of the gospel. Lord, we thank you for your ability to change hearts and to bring us uh, saving faith and that you sent Christ into the world, that you made his message known and that you changed hearts to believe uh, the truth. Lord, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.